Hi, my name is Matt. Welcome back to the shop. And today we're talking about the Wizard Engine. So the Wizard Engine. <laughs> oh, what a shit pun. The Wizard Engine is my favourite engine of all time. I was fortunate for quite a while at Elvington to work on uh, machining some custom replacement parts for this engine. And the Wizard Engine, of course, is the V12 Merlin engine. Now. Yeah, there's a lot of people who get all fucking patriotic and British about the Merlin engine. I don't. Um, it's not the fact that it went in the Spitfire, to be quite honest, a lot more of them went in Hurricanes, and the Hurricanes shot down a lot more Nazis and what have you than the Spitfire. I don't know why we all club behind the Spitfire. Eh, it's a nice aircraft, but, you know, pfft. the engine, the Merlin engine, is absolutely fantastic. Now, it has a lot of failures... Uh, especially looking at it in you know retrospect looking back at the engine uh, it had SU updraft carbs which were just a bad idea compared to the Messerschmitts which were their competition at the time uh, you know the ME is it 209s, 208s, 209s, I think it's 209s um, you know it, it, yeah it had its it had its drawbacks the thing about the Merlin engine which I kind of want to draw your attention to is people's ideas of when technologies first appeared and stuff like that. So the Merlin V12 um, has some unique characteristics, not unique specifically to that engine, but unique as in we don't see them things anymore nowadays. So one of the things that the Merlin had, it was obviously a, um, a V12 engine, so it's got uh, two banks of six cylinders, but the cool thing was is that the Merlin was symmetrical. So nowadays, if you look at a V6, you'll have a lot of banker cylinders here, and then you'll have a banker cylinders here, like so. And that's your standard V6 that you'll get nowadays. The reason why is you have a crank running down the middle of it, and then you'll have a conrod here, and then you have to have a conrod here. Obviously, conrods can't... You know, if you have a, a conrod here like this, you can't have another conrod sitting in the same location like that. They're clashing, they're interfering with each other. You couldn't possibly do that. Well, you can, and that's what the Merlin did. Now, structurally, it's not a very good idea, and it kind of limited the engine's horsepower in one sense. Uh, they, If they wanted to, they really couldn't push it beyond 1,500 horsepower for the simple fact is the rods would probably give out. And what they have is they have what you call a fork and blade system. So you have one con rod like this, Here's your big end, there's your small end, and then they have another conrod like this, which is your fork and your blade. It has a really complicated, I'll put a picture up now, it has a really complicated set of shell bearings, and obviously your crank pin used to fit in between there. But as you can see, this is symmetrical. You can have your cylinders in line, um, which I love because I love symmetry. Um, one of the problems with this is the actual fork rod itself. So you have a fork rod like this, and the real weakness is in here. Even when you radius it, the real weakness is in there. As you apply force, and it's upside down, but if you apply force here, and a hell of a lot of force, it causes the rod to want to squash. So the rod squashes like this, and it wants to bulge out here and here, and it wants to break. So they were limited. It didn't physically limit them yet, but you could only you could only theoretically push that engine so far before your um, fork rods would start to break. To stiffen these up, you can see a picture now. The uh, actual rod body. So the rod itself, when you look at the rod here and it has its hole, it's all stiffened up here to um, counteract that it wanting to break. If you look at modern rods nowadays, the cross section here is very, very thin where they couldn't do that back then in the day. So that's one thing. This engine, the Merlin engine, I'm pretty sure, and this is all off the top of my head, I think the design for the Merlin engine was 1930. I think that's when they started to do the drawings, come out with the concept for it. So in 1930 for the Merlin, we had, uh, it was water-cooled, it had a dry sump system um, with several scavenger pumps. It had uh, four valves per head. Four valves per head. The uh, block and the cylinders, pretty much all of it, was made out of aluminium. 
um, it had a two stage, well the original one didn't and then the next version had a single stage supercharger it's a centrifugal supercharger which as I've said before are quite inefficient um, but it had a two it had a two speed supercharger so it was a two speed uh, supercharged uh, which they had to do to make sure that all the cylinders didn't get starved because you're feeding in your fuel and air from one end and because of acceleration and the masses of the molecules the uh, vacuum or the lower pressure that you're drawing in your front end cylinders would literally strip the um, the charge of its fuel and basically they would just starve out at the far end um, so they use a supercharger to make sure there's a lot of turbulence in there squash it all in to make sure the engine could actually not start having cylinder starvation um, so yeah it's a water cooled it was a dry sump system four valves per head uh, it had sodium filled valves I'll probably do a video on that basically all they are is they are valves that are hollow so the valve stem itself is hollow and inside this they fill it about a third the way with sodium and what happens is is that when you push your valve down because of um, inertia and uh, the resistance one move when you push the valve down suddenly the um, sodium used to pop up to the top and the sodium used to melt and when you go from a transition from a material from a powder to a liquid it absorbs a lot of heat when it does that and it used to basically take away a lot of heat from the valve head and then stick it on the other side of the valve um, which is basically just trying to relieve detonation and stuff and remove heat from the system um, the one thing it did have is that the valves were straight down so the valves were straight down like this and then there was a camshaft in the middle uh, with rockers um, and the actual cam drive was with bevel gears um, so it was a direct drive there was no chains and sprockets and stuff um, or belts it was basically a load of geared shafts uh, which were quite which are horrifically loud um, but yeah so you used to have a, it was an in head recessed combustion chamber so it's like this, that was your combustion chamber with your cylinders um, and then the valves basically just popped into uh, into the combustion chamber so the compression ratios really weren't that high like I said, you could only push the engine so far before but it was literally, you know, this is 1930s you know, so you think of um, motorcycles and stuff in the 1950s and 60s you know, they're still pissing around with air cooling where in 1930 they were making the Merlin engines and mass producing them at massive rates you know these engines are fucking massive I think they're like 800, uh, 780 kilos or something crazy like that um, but yeah water cooled dry sump, 4 valves, uh, aluminium it was a uh, one piece forged crankshaft, a beautiful crankshaft if you heard me go um, like I said we had these uh, split rods um, I'm trying to think what else they used to have it was supercharged had a, a massive array of gearing, planetary gearing to uh, get the superchargers up to speed um, and like I said there's a two speed governor, there's a selector governor where you can change speed from one supercharger to another and um, they used to have uh, two spark plugs per cylinder but that wasn't um, some kind of gimmick or anything like that that was actually uh, for redundancies, they had a magneto for each bank and um, all the cylinders had two spark plugs just in case one failed there was a backup there as a redundancy because obviously if you're flying your aircraft you don't want um, your engine to cut out and you fall out of the sky or cylinders start to cut out or what have you so there's a redundant system it was a dry sump system and it had to be so you could invert the aircraft uh, what else is there? And pretty much that's it as far as I can imagine but yeah, it was a, there was there was some awesome technologies in an engine that was mass produced. We're talking, I think there was like twelve thousand um, engines built in total. I don't know if that's just for the that can't be just for the Spitfire Hurricane, but it went into Lancaster bombers and stuff like that. And obviously, the Americans licensed out this engine from Rolls Royce um, and put it in the P fifty one Mustang so you know even on the american side of things you know that engine fought the nazis it also fought the you know the japanese and 
Was it a superior engine? Compared to the Messerschmitt engine, the Daimler engine, probably not because that was fuel injected. Um, and weirdly enough, actually, uh, the Merlin engine was as, you, as you'd expect. It had a crankshaft, it had two cylinder banks at 60 degrees inclusive, and the uh, Messerschmitt engine was actually upside down. They had the crank and the cylinders like this. Uh, I don't actually know why, I haven't really looked into it, um, but they decided that they wanted it obviously upside down. Maybe it was just because they were the enemy. Oh, well, the Brits are doing it this way, so let's turn it upside down because we want to be different than them. I'm sure it's not that. I'm sure they had a good reason. Uh, but again, they were using a dry sump system and what have you, and fuel injection and so on. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else about why I love this engine. The reason why I love this engine is, one, the symmetry. Number two, it had some cool technologies. You know, and these were... Not brand new, but it was just all in the culmination of one engine. Um, oh, actually, one other thing that they did, which is quite interesting, um, because it's about energy and stuff. It's uh, one of them physical things. Um, what they have on the cylinder head, so the Spitfire has this long, long cylinder head with all these exhaust ports sticking out of it. Uh, and then on the back it used to have a round section with the drive so that was the bevel drive there and then it used to have this top cover the rocker cover like this and then it used to go down something like that if i remember it rightly and you used to have all these pipes for your oil your water cooling and stuff but the exhausts basically just used to um have a, a little shitty exhaust pipe that used to stick out like this and that was it and then what they did is they realized that they were wasting power and instead of having an exhaust pipe that just stuck out like this, what they did is they replaced it with a fluted exhaust pipe and then pointed it backwards. So more precisely, it was like this. And if you look at that in a 3D, it's kind of like a weird flat trumpety thing like this. And the reason why is the exhaust gases had so much energy in them that it would create thrust. You could actually create more horsepower. Uh, not so much horsepower, but thrust, because this is obviously uh, not for land use, it's for an aircraft, you know, you fly in the sky with it. Um, it's all about thrust, you know, the propeller is trying to, there's no friction there, um, you know, with contact with the ground or anything. Uh, it's all about thrust, you know, it's about blowing air behind you um, quicker than the air around you, and that's how you create thrust. So. They angled the exhaust pipes backwards and then basically fluted them so they could get the maximum velocities, the maximum speeds out of these exhausts by basically creating a nozzle. And this nozzle used to give them, I can't remember what they said, it was something like 200 extra horsepower just by fitting these exhausts. Do you think about that? That's crazy. You know, if you think about that, that's madness. You know, I think it was 200 horsepower, but 200 horsepower just by, you know, um, ma take, making use of your exhaust gas velocities you know they've got energy they've got heat put into a nozzle it's going to accelerate even faster so and it's giving you thrust you know that's crazy although seeing as though we're on the subject and i don't really have a video to put it into i think it'll belong here really um it's not the only time and even nowadays we actually do use exhaust velocities um to our benefit so if you ever go dragster racing, or you go and see the dragster racing, you'll see the back of the fairing of the bikes like this, with this big stupid wing on it, or what have you. They'll have your, you know, your super twin or whatever engine. And then you'll see the exhaust pipes literally stick, and the guy's arse is here. The exhaust pipes stick right out of his arse, pointing upwards. And the reason why is when you go full chat with that engine, that it is, you know, applying a force outwards like that which in turn forces the bike down. It actually, you know, it's basically trying to push against the air and it creates more downforce so the rear wheel can grip and get better traction into the floor. So if you think about that, that's pretty crazy, but that's the same kind of thing that they did with the Spitfire eventually. And I think they did it with the P51 Mustang, they must have done. But uh, yes, that's my favorite particular engine just because um, it was, you know, it was very well engineered. It was very successful, hence why Rolls Royce did so well after the war. And also, 
you know, it was bought by the Americans and put into their number one uh, fighter aircraft of the day. You know, the P-51 Mustangs even saw um, actual combat in Vietnam, you know, which was in the 1960s. Um, but yes, I do love the engine, you know, it, it's, it's an incredible engine. Um, just because of uh, how complicated some of the systems, um, which were brand new for the day, or pretty new, and how they implemented them. But not only that, is how they stuck it into a package which was then manufactured by unskilled workers. You know, a lot of women, a lot of old men, a lot of people have never used lathes, milling machine casting equipment before. In wartime, and they produced this powerful engine. It's not ridiculously powerful, you know, it wasn't ridiculously efficient. But with what they had, the time they had, and so on, it is a beautiful engine. Um, it's not anything about, you know, oh, the Battle of Britain and all that shite. You know what I mean? The fact of the matter is, is we all seem to have got our knickers in a twist because we think the Spitfire's great. It's really uh, the hurricane that really won us the Battle of Britain. But, um, yeah, that's my favourite engine. And uh, I'll see you in a bit.